everyone can hear me. Um, my name is Kerry Walter, and I'm from an organization called VOLPRO, which stands for a Vulture Program. And I started in vulture conservation 20 years ago, and it wasn't until I was working with um, the organization that I was working for after two years where I actually, uh, where my love grew for the species, I had an opportunity of hand raising my first care vulture. Many of the participants know Percy. Um, he's done amazing work for vulture conservation, but it really was at this point um, where my passion and my love and my understanding grew for the species. And I also um, started believing that it was a true calling and that this was my reason for for my existence, I guess. And that's kind of how I've come to have established Volpro. Um, we're now 16 years old and we are continuing trying to save Africa's vultures. Great. I'm uh, Darcy Ogata. I am the Africa Program Director and I work for the Peregrine Fund and I'm based just outside of Nairobi, Kenya, although I work much further north for the most part in Kenya. And yeah, I would say, you know, it's vultures are hard not to love once you get to know them. Um, I think I've always been attracted to the kind of losers. <laughs> I came to vultures by way of owls, which are not well loved either. Um, so yeah, getting involved with vultures is is definitely something that you grow to love because you realize they need a lot of love. And um, I think my son here, who was two in this photo, you know, this was, it's been kind of part of the background of his life because obviously here you can see he was pretty keen when he was two to be in the field with me. Next. And then, yeah, and then you still get that interest when he's about five. And I think this is the first and only time he went out to the field when we were catching vultures, because little did he know that actually catching vultures involves like about four to six hours of sitting in a car waiting. <laughs> Luckily, we caught something. Next. And then this is just last month, actually. Um, this is him now 15 years old and the only thing I can get him actually out in the field with in terms of vultures is if, I, if we go out in a helicopter and we um we we count vultures um in their rupels vultures in their nesting cliffs up north in Kenya and this is Martin Odino who works for uh, for the project as well so yeah it's been great to um you know have this as a backdrop have him growing up alongside vultures Hi, uh, so my name is Corinne Kendall. I work for North Carolina Zoo. And yeah, I think like like Darcy, my passion for vultures has come out of a, a love of underdog species. So I've, I've worked for several different zoos throughout my career and I've gotten to work with all kinds of strange animals. Um, I had studied uh, hippos for my, my master's work and then heard about the declines of vultures in Asia a lot of which was made more problematic by the lack of, of knowledge about vultures, about what they're susceptible to, about their behavior, and even just in terms of population monitoring. And so that was part of how I got interested in, in African vultures and started working on them in, in 2008, uh, first in Kenya and now in Tanzania. And so in my current role, I, I get to do a lot of vulture work, but I also work on a variety of different conservation projects for the, the zoo. Kerry, could you please share with us how uh, vultures are adapted to be these super efficient scavengers? Sure. So vultures have incredibly strong and powerful stomach acid. And this means that they're able to consume carcasses that have died or that have been exposed to various infectious diseases or bacteria. And um, they're, they're able to actually digest this without being negatively affected in comparison to other scavengers 
like jackals or whatnot that potentially would negatively be affected by various infectious diseases. And diseases, we're talking about things like anthrax, botulism, TB, et cetera. And, and so this makes them so incredibly unique and no other scavenger can actually fulfill this phenomenal role. So Darcy, a lot of people uh, will not have vultures as part of their daily lives. Why are vultures important to us? Yeah, of course not. Um, and a lot of people don't love vultures like we do either. So it's really important to understand their role in, in the ecosystem. I'm sure a lot of us on this, um, on this call know a lot about that already. Um, we did some experiments back in 2010 where we were actually putting out carcasses that had vultures that so we were putting them in the open like this and these are um this series of of photographs are taken over about three hours and 40 minutes so you can see there was 151 vultures there um and that lasted three hours and 40 minutes now if you go to the next slide, Carrie, um, we also put vultures, I'm sorry, carcasses underneath trees um, so that the vultures couldn't couldn't um, see them because they only find carcasses by eyesight. And so these are the same put out at the same time of day, but these uh, this is going a bit fast, but anyway, these are these are photos showing the same series of, of, of photos, but this now is over 18 hours because when you don't have vultures, um, you're you're introducing a lot of other scavengers to the carcasses, as as Carrie just said. So we had jackals, we have hyenas. Um, we all know that jackals being canids are pretty susceptible to carrying and transmitting diseases. So when you don't have vultures at carcasses, we have a lot of concern about what um, diseases could be transmitted um, less from the carcass, but more from the mammals that would come and visit the carcass when they come in close contact with each other. So these are just two photos, um, obviously showing the, the vultures at a carcass above, and the photo below is, is actually from India, um, and that's kind of what happens now a, a lot these days because of the vulture, massive vulture declines that have happened in South Asia. Um, and yeah, that we are, you know, looking at that possibly, you know, in Africa as well, because we have a lot of areas just in Kenya where, you know, we're seeing a lot of dogs um, at carcasses. So it's a real concern in terms of disease transmission. So we really need the vultures um, because they, they come to the carcasses really fast um, and dispose of them really quickly. And that's a really important ecological role that is not filled by any other scavenger. Thank you. Um, Karine, could you please talk to us about uh, what is a unique and special about vulture movement? So anybody that's seen vultures, um, they're pretty clunky on the ground. So when, they, when they're when they on the ground, they're kind of hopping around and they're not actually that great at flapping. It takes them a little while to get up and off the ground because they're such heavy birds. They can weigh uh, five to six kilograms for, for a whiteback vulture like this. So that's, that's a pretty large bird. But what's amazing is that once they get into the air, they basically can fly at very, very little energetic cost. So their wings work very well once they're, they're up and soaring like this. They can hold their wings out in that position without having to use a lot of energy. And that allows these birds to soar and travel huge distances without having um, much of an energetic cost. So uh, you can flip forward, Carrie, there's a couple more soaring vulture pictures, but um, these birds are capable of very high flight. Uh, as Darcy mentioned, they're mostly using eyesight to find their carcasses. So they're, they're way up in the air and they're actually looking not so much for necessarily the carcass on the ground, but they're looking for each other. So they create these amazing aerial networks where one vulture is watching another vulture or even another bird of prey, waiting for it to drop and then utilizing that to decide uh, when and where it should come down. So that, that flight and that long distance ability is really important. And vultures can travel several hundred kilometers in a single day. 
Even more amazing, uh, next slide, is perhaps seeing what, what a single bird can be capable of. Um, so this was a culture that we had tagged in Ruaha National Park in Tanzania, and this bird traveled about 2,000 kilometers. And this was a younger bird. Um, vultures aren't, um, at least most, most African vultures are not migratory. So this isn't a migration event where this bird is traveling with a flock. This is a single individual flying through all of these different countries where it has never been, with no map, with no, no prior knowledge, and, and yet it was very successful in, in doing so. And not just the, the distance that it traveled, but its ability to use the landscape. It, it stopped at vulture restaurants, at crocodile farms, at uh, different interesting um, protected areas along the way as it made its route from Tanzania down into South Africa. And it's that, that flight and that ability to to find other birds and utilize that social information in the sky that makes vultures so incredible. Uh, uh, next slide. Part of what's really important about that, um, and we talked about why vultures are better scavengers than, than mammals, is that it gives vultures this really large foraging radius. So hyenas, uh, lions, jackals can all be very effective scavengers, but they're limited in how far they can travel on a daily basis, partially because they're walking on the ground, but also because they have offspring um, that need to be cared for and they can't travel large distances. Vultures can travel several hundred kilometers from their nest each day. And so it gives them this ability to utilize a huge landscape. And that's really critical when you have in influxes in dead animals. So if we have a drought or you have a, um, an, a disease outbreak, like an anthrax outbreak, you might suddenly have hundreds of carcasses on your hands. And if those sit out, they're gonna to continue to spread the disease that, um, that the outbreak came from, or they might create other disease outbreaks themselves. But vultures are able to respond to that. Hundreds of birds can come into an area where there's been a recent disease um, outbreak or a recent influx in carcasses because of that amazing soaring, that amazing um, foraging ecology that they have. So um, that makes them not just good at scavenging on a normal day-to-day -day basis in their landscape, but also at responding to these mass mortality events, which really have a lot of potential to be um, big, big disease outbreak uh, time periods. Oh, next slide, there you go. Kerry, could you please talk to us about um, sharing your personal space with vultures every day and working with them? Sure, I think I have um, an absolute privilege being able to work with the birds every day. You know, we've got probably the largest African vulture center in the world with 270 birds. So I literally spend time with them every single solitary day. And I think what makes us really special is you know, apart from the theory and understanding the importance of, you know, protecting the species and why we need them, there's also an emotive side of things. And, and in order to try and get that message across to the public, it really does help by nurturing my own personal connection with them. Um, it is impossible to try and change people's perceptions without being emotionally invested or connected with the birds. And I think it really just helps, you know, every single day, either treating them or spending time with them. Um, and it's just, it's, a, it's an absolute privilege um, that, that I'm able to do. But it really does allow me to understand them, their little intricate personalities. Um, and that helps me to, to better protect and conserve and even uh, treat them when, when I need to treat them. Thank you. And starting with Darcy, could you please discuss the threats to vultures? Yeah, so I think probably a lot of people know um, poisoning is the biggest threat to vultures globally. Um, poisoning, of course, takes many different forms, though, because there's there's intentional poisoning, there's unintentional poisoning, but there's poisoning using what we mostly deal with here in Africa, which is pesticides. But of course, um, like the situation in South Asia, the poisoning of vultures was due to uh, veterinary drugs. And of course, the, there's a lot of poisoning of 
California condors, which is a critically endangered species in the Western US, and that's due to lead poisoning. So there's a lot of different kinds of poisoning, um, but mostly what we deal with as a really direct threat here throughout most of Africa is um, pesticide poisoning. Um, a lot of people are, um, people use pesticides uh, to kill carnivores and that's that human wild human carnivore conflict is really the driver of a lot of the poisoning that we're seeing of vultures. Um, it's it's not just in Africa, actually. Human carnivore conflict um, is driving poisoning of vultures, probably the leading cause of poisoning worldwide. Um, it's very prevalent also in Europe. Uh, so, you know, people use these pesticides because they're silent. Um, they're really cheap. You can get them easily um, in any small kiosks or anywhere people sell anything to do with farm um, implements. And they're highly effective. Um, everybody knows, you know, there's a lot of, you know, easy and cheap ways to poison what people think of as pests. Um, so this doesn't mean they're intentionally poisoning the vultures. Um, in this case, it's the carnivores. Ne next slide. Um, so yeah, and this is exactly what I was I was just mentioning. Um, this was from the Masai Mara in I think 2013, if I'm not mistaken. Um, next slide. Yeah, and this is another incident we had in northern Kenya, um, and this is pretty much what it looks like when you arrive on the scene. Uh, you're dealing, you know, with a lot of dead birds and usually some live birds. Um, this was 32 vultures and 120 eagle. It's important to realize, you know, we're vultures are disproportionately killed at any um, poisoning event, um, but there's a lot of other species that are, you know being poisoned at these events. So there's almost always eagles, um, often tawny eagles in our case, sometimes battle lures. Um, we often get jackals. Recently, we had a monitor lizard. Um, so it it's a huge um, number of species that, you know, poisoning can kill because it's not targeted at anything. Um, so yeah, and there's a lot of lessons to be learned actually, because like at this this particular poisoning event, um, the next day herders didn't realize that after this site was burned, that actually the, the soil was still contaminated and they brought in a herd of livestock, a herd of cows, and two of them died after feeding, grazing in this area. So it's highly toxic, it, you know, it's still there in, in the soils or in the grasses. And yeah, and it's a really unfortunate way for people to, you know, besides the vultures, just people losing their own livelihoods when you use poisons. So next slide. And so, like I said, yeah, this is a pictorial from an incident that happened in Raha in Tanzania. And this is often the case, uh, what, what you'll see is oh, a cow was killed by a lion. Um, that carcass was poison targeting the lion. It's important to remember that often the, the targeted carnivore may or may not come back. I think most of the time we see that they actually don't get killed, but it's always, always the vultures, always, always. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, a small, tiny carcass, there's always vultures there. Um, and in this case, yeah, you can see there was also hyena, jackal, of course, there was a few eagles, but disproportionately, there's vultures. Um, and this is a very typical case. And um, yeah, so this is a very, oops, next slide. That's a very, yeah, typical case. But then we also see a lot of, we also see intentional poisoning of vultures for what we call belief-based use. This can be anything from what people would call traditional medicine, um, muti is um, fetish, you know, whatever, whatever your beliefs are in various areas of the continent, um, this is what we're terming belief-based use. And this happens pretty much in every country 
in Africa. Um, there's very few countries, I don't think you would not find this kind of intentional poisoning. So generally they're using pesticides um, for this type of poisoning and then harvesting these car these um, at dead carcasses with, um, and then selling them in the market. And we don't always know um, what happens, like how these are used in, in terms of, are they ingested? Are they you know, bringing more um, harm to humans because of that? So the, the buyers don't know that these, most of these vultures and other birds are being killed using poisons, but that's generally how, that, how it happens. There's a big problem in, in South Africa in particular, but extremely big problem um, throughout almost all of West Africa and a bit into Central Africa in terms of this belief base use. And we've really, really seen um, a huge loss of vultures in particularly in West Africa because of this. Next. Um, so in addition to the motivations for poisoning that Darcy's already talked about, there are, there are some other ones as well. So one of the problems that we've seen more recently is that poachers also will use pesticides to kill vultures. And so a typical scenario might be that they've they've shot a lion or they've shot an elephant and they're going to be collecting that ivory. And during that time period, vultures will be landing and taking off um, and moving around that carcass. And that's an opportunity for rangers to discover where poachers are. And unfortunately, poachers have come to recognize this role that vultures are playing. And so they will also lace the carcass with pesticides in order to kill vultures. Next slide. And you can imagine if you can kill uh, 55 vultures at a cow carcass, at an elephant carcass, we're talking about hundreds of vultures dead um, from a single poisoning event. And so this poisoning, while it's a lot rarer than human wildlife conflict-based poisoning, um, has a huge impact when it does occur because so many birds will be attracted into an elephant carcass like this. In addition to uh, ivory poaching, we've also seen poisoning related to bushmeat poaching. So if people have a large snare line out um, where they might be catching different antelope species, vultures are both going to be competitors coming and eating some of those dead antelope. Um, but they also can bring in rangers to those snare lines. And so in uh, Nereri National Park in Tanzania, uh, next slide, we've had incidents where hundreds of birds have been killed in relation to bushmeat poaching as well. Um, and again, in, and in some of these cases, poachers have an additional incentive because they can also collect multiple heads. So they get a bonus of being able to collect um, the ungulates that they're actually hunting at the snares, plus getting some vultures and vulture body parts on the, on the side. So this can be a really, really devastating combination. Um, so obviously, this, obviously this is tied to other illegal activities that are, are so challenging to control and prevent. Next slide. Okay, so power lines is probably the biggest threat that all proceeds on a daily basis. It is very well known um, in South Africa, but interestingly, it's not well known or not well spoken about globally and the effects it has, um, power lines have on vultures. Um, two ways birds are affected or, or vultures are affected, they fly into the overhead wires and they break their wings, um, or if they end up hitting the ground hard, they die instantly. And it is often a really slow death. You have injuries like this, and the bird is often still alive. Um, we get them in there, emaciated, dehydrated, and pretty much on death's door. Um, uh, our aim is to always try and save as many as we possibly can because many vultures are either endangered or critically endangered. So if bones are sticking out, we will amputate their wings, and I'll explain to you why we do that later on um, but they do have a really good quality of life even being disabled in captivity and they are able to contribute to their wild counterparts the other issue is electrocutions or sometimes the birds getting stuck on actual power line structures sometimes they die instantly sometimes they are still alive even if they are stuck on these large transmission lines um, as you can see, sometimes even your transformers are a badly affect vultures 
and they can get either stuck, even a tiny little talon can get stuck in um, one of the wires or the connectors, should I say, and they're not able to actually fall off or um, yeah, just loosen themselves. Uh, electrocution where the birds are burnt, um, some die instantly, um, some not. This particular bird, can you believe it was still alive? But that is the effect of what electrocution does. And, there, and it is absolutely horrid because it just basically singes the birds. Another thing that people do not understand is that power lines don't only affect one or two birds at a time. We've had 11 birds that have died from an electrocution on one structure alone. And this is again, not often spoken about or understood. So it's not necessarily just a once off incident or one bird at one particular structure. There can be multiple fatalities. Um, those are again, just some images of a dead bird that um, actually, um, uh, this was a power line collision, but we did not uh, find the bird early enough or were not alerted. So this bird, unfortunately, had a really, really, really horrible slow death. Um, and that's what happens with power line collisions. They, even with broken wings, they can walk. Sometimes they'll get predated on. Sometimes they'll either starve or dehydrate until they just can't go on anymore. Those images are typical electrocutions where the wings are completely singed. Sometimes the bird explodes and the wing actually comes off completely. Um, electrocutions also cause fault fires. And this is obviously hugely problematic for farmers, especially with livestock. And that is the result of what a fault fire an electrocuted bird um, looks like after a fault fire. Um, yeah, that's it. Corinne, could you please talk to us about how and why we should study vulture movement and migration? Sure. Um, so vulture, there's vulture movement is a tool that all three of us use in our conservation practices to, to protect vultures. So I'll start by talking about how you tag a vulture, and then I'll talk a little bit about the reasons that we want to do that. So tagging vultures is a um, very eventful activity. So we, we basically use a carcass. We put nooses down onto the carcass, these little loops. The birds come and feed as they're hopping around. They get a foot typically caught in one of those loops, and then we're able to run up and cover them with a towel. Um, once we have the bird in hand, we'll take some blood and some measurements, and it usually takes about 15 minutes um, to do everything we want before we can release the bird again. And the main purpose of trapping is usually to put uh, these satellite or GSM tags onto the birds, because these provide us with really valuable information about where the birds go and um, how they're using the landscape. So next slide. So here you can just see an example of a um, bird taking off after, after its quick uh, time with us. Um, and, and then we'll be provided with daily downloads of where the bird is and um, when it's flying, when it's on the ground and things like that. So next slide. So there's a lot of value that we get out of studying vulture movement. It provides us with information about their range size and their habitat use within the landscapes um, where they exist. It also can provide us with really interesting information about corridors and connectivity. Um, in Tanzania, we were able to provide vulture data to a national corridor um, plan. And we saw that from that, that there's a lot of overlap in the corridors that elephants use and the corridors used by vultures. And in general, vultures are probably a better way to identify these corridors because unlike elephants and lions, where you might have to wait for a dispersing individual to see areas they're using to get from place to place, a vulture might be using that place on an, uh, that, that area on an annual basis. And you can see even across, this is several different individuals, um, you can see the consistency in those paths that they're using to get from one protected area to the next. So they're really providing us with great information about what connectivity does exist. Um, and I think cases like the, the bird that we showed the image of the long dispersal from earlier, you can see you know, even from Tanzania to South Africa, there's enough habitat for an animal to move, avoiding large cities, um, staying out of areas with a lot of people through that movement. And so vultures are giving us insight into the incredible connectivity that does still exist across the African continent. Next slide. 
unfortunately, this is also a challenge for vultures. So many um, vultures are going to be moving between countries, sometimes between many different countries. Um, this just is some some a map of a large number of vultures that have been tagged across Africa um, from a big collaborative study. And you can see the Cape vultures, that gives you a sense of kind of movement that's been detected from birds tagged mostly in South Africa. Whiteback vultures, that gives you a sense of their movement across East and, and Southern Africa, and then the repels um, in the far right. And so you can see these birds don't utilize, um, they don't understand national boundaries, and they also don't understand protected area boundaries. And so unfortunately, they, they do end up moving into parts of the landscape where they're going to encounter poisoning, where they're going to encounter power lines. Um, and as we saw, that's where they're coming into a lot of trouble. But knowing these movement patterns helps us to identify where, um, what power lines what we, might we expect to be most problematic, what, um, uh, what corridors are they still using, uh, where should we not put wind farms. Um, it can provide useful information like that. Next slide. In addition, on the, the sadder side of, of studying vulture movement, we also get a lot of information about mortality. We can learn where the birds are dying, what they're dying from, and how frequently they're dying. And unfortunately, in some places, um, both in Masai Mara and uh, more recently, we've been able to establish in southern Tanzania, you can have uh, to 30% annual mortality of, of vultures related to poisoning activities. And so that's staggering and very concerning. And you can see, though, that we are with this information, able to identify where the birds are being uh, poisoned and to understand where we need to focus our conservation efforts. And not too surprisingly, a lot of poisoning happens along the borders between protected areas um, and where they neighbor pastoral areas. And that's where a lot of poisoning happens because that's also where a lot of the human public conflict occurs. Um, but again, with other types of, of poisoning that can be motivated by poaching activities as well, we see that you can also have poisoning inside protected areas. So these are some of the challenges when we're faced with in trying to address the needs for, for vulture conservation. Next slide. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, Darcy, could you please talk to us about the role of communities in vulture conservation? Next slide. Yeah, so up in Northern Kenya, uh, we work together, we work very closely uh, with a carnivore conservation group, which is called Lion Landscapes. And basically, we're, our aim is to help people better coexist with wildlife. Next slide. Yeah, so I work with a team of four other, four people, four Kenyans, and we, they're doing trainings um, pretty much every month throughout the year. Um, in, in a typical year, they'll train almost 800 people. Um, and this is focused trainings. These are what people we invite. These are people from communities that border conservancies uh, or other protected areas where the hot spots of most of this carnivore conflict exists. So we are working um, in and amongst these communities. And we basically develop a network of people and we are bringing them in for trainings um, that are day long trainings. And the trainings are focused on one, um, one main thing is livestock management. And we talk about various ways that people can improve their livestock herding. Um, and, and this is all to reduce conflict with carnivores. Um, and we also talk about building uh, what BOMAs, I think probably a lot of people are familiar with that term, maybe even in Southern Africa. Um, but these are the, the, the livestock corrals where the animals are kept at night. And so basically we're helping them we're helping them to learn how to construct these BOMAs. Um, they are basically chain link, but there's some particular areas um, if they don't do carefully, like the, adding the doors and making sure that particularly hyenas cannot go underneath these, these um, BOMAs. Um, those, those are the particular things we focus on in the training. 
we also talk about a lot about poisoning awareness. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, there's a lot of things that people don't realize about pesticides in terms of how toxic they are, how they can remain on the landscape, and basically, you know, the harms they can do to themselves, as well as obviously all the wildlife and the environment in general. Um, so people are really, really receptive to these trainings. Um, we've done, a, we've trained almost 4,000 people now, and this is 70% are community people. And we also train um, people like rangers. Um, we train government employees, people who work in like environment department, um, the Kenya Wildlife Service rangers. Um, we The team has trained a, a huge number and variety of people. Next slide. And yeah, over the last four years, um, we have seen our, the communities that we work with build a minimum, this is hard to always get the exact number, but of 600 of these BOMAs, reinforced BOMAs have been built. And you can see, we don't provide any materials or any, um, any financial help. We just provide the know-how during our trainings. So we're trying to empower people really to try and um, solve these problems as much as they can by themselves because they know the government usually is not going to be able to be there to help them either. Um, so it's about trying to build a network where people feel empowered, where they want to build these. Um, and they often, you know, it comes you know, you can see, you can go to villages and you can find, you know, 20 or 30 of these because people really believe in it um, once they see it. But these are just a kind of different, um, they look all different because people use their own resources um, and and that's how it works. And then my team goes out and they, and this is my team in the center, um, they go out and they meet people who, who have built these and they talk about, you know, whether they're structurally sound and what they could improve. Um, next slide. I think that's it for me. Yep. Yep. Um, uh, Terry, could you please share about the uh, apology? Could you please share, Corrine, could you please share about the role of rangers? Sure. Um, so rangers are really the first line of response when there's a big poisoning event. They're often going to be one of the first groups on the on the scene. Um, but historically, they haven't had a good sense of what, what to do, how to protect themselves from the pesticides that are on these carcasses, which, um, as, as Darcy's mentioned, can be toxic even several days later, how to collect the right kind of samples and evidence to make sure that they can prosecute um, and hopefully figure out who committed this crime, um, who, who put the pesticides out, um, how they can take care of birds that might be sick on the scene, um, it's also important to get a really good count of uh, what birds are there and to do a thorough search um, to make sure that you're not missing any, any injured uh, birds that, that maybe could be assisted. And then one of the other key issues that uh, previously has been missed is how you dispose of the carcass. After a poisoning event, it's really critical to get rid of the carcass and to get rid of any other contaminated carcasses to prevent additional deaths of vultures and other species that may come upon them. And so one of the things that we've focused on in Tanzania has been doing ranger trainings around all of these topics, making sure that people are prepared for when a real poisoning happens. So next slide. Um, so this is some pictures from some actual poisoning cases, and you can see that the the rangers have been, that have gone through our training are prepared with what they need to do in terms of collecting samples, um, in terms of finding birds, and in terms of disposing of the carcass. And these kind of trainings has, have assisted in better prosecution as well. And so we've had a few cases where uh, rangers have actually been able to identify who did the poisoning. In probably our most successful case, they actually identified a person that was going community to community offering pesticides as a solution for your, your lion or carnivore problems. Um, so being able to do the evidence collection to, to get to that level is really critical and helps in, in one case to actually prevent not just the person who had done the poisoning, but someone who was, was providing this as a resource and an idea to a much broader set of people. So it's really important to be, to be able to address 
poisoning when it happens. And so we've trained several hundred rangers and village game scouts in Tanzania so that they're prepared when these events do occur. Next slide. Kerry, could you please talk to us about the vital role of um, rehabilitation and captive breeding centers such as Volpro? Sure. So um, I spoke to you earlier about having to sometimes amputate um, Volta's wings uh, from power line collisions. And the reason why we do this is because vultures are endangered and critically endangered, every single individual actually matters. So these disabled vultures are able to breed in captivity and actually contribute to the survival of their wild counterparts through population supplementation, as well as potentially full-blown um, reintroduction programs. And captive breeding has been widely used globally for many species like the Californian condor, the bearded vulture in Europe are very successful. Um, in Europe now, the cinerous vulture and also the griffin vulture, which has been incredibly successful. And so capture breeding really does allow disabled birds to contribute to their wild counterpart survival through these various um, programs. And uh, this helps as well um, to put back what is lost to the wild populations due to the numerous threats that vultures face. Um, and it also, you know, for education, you don't need hundreds of vultures in captivity, but you need a whole bunch if you are going to have um, extensive breeding programs in order to try and supplement the dwindling um, populations. And captive breeding takes many, many years um, in order to be successful. Um, and so it's, it's a very long drawn out program. With regards to rehabilitation, again, the same thing happens. And I've put this quote up here, where basically it talks about how important it is to save every single individual, because every single individual actually matters. And often in conservation, we talk about, you know, focusing on the population and protecting the population. And sometimes we forget that actually populations are made up of individual um, individuals. And if we don't save every individual that we possibly can, we're not going to have populations to actually um, nurture and save. And so we try and save as many injured, grounded or disabled vultures as we possibly can from power line incidents to poisoning to young birds actually just getting themselves into really difficult uh, areas and they can't take off. Um, with climate change, temperatures are soaring, birds are not able to withstand those incredible high temperatures and they're becoming dehydrated. Young birds, this was a case that we had actually in December, this little fledgling um, f got caught in a tree. He obviously came down hard and he got caught in the tree and we actually unfortunately couldn't save his wing. Um, but this is what happens with young individual birds. And the ultimate goal is always to release as many as we possibly can. We don't want birds in captivity. That's not their aim. The idea is to release and to put back to, to the wild populations in order to prevent further losses. And if we can't, we then are able to utilize uh, non-releasable birds for captive breeding where they can still contribute to their wild counterparts. And that these two programs, are hugely, hugely vital in order to continue um, protecting the species. I'm going to ask you, Kerry, if we could perhaps save this for the Q&A, for the very start of the Q&A, because we're right on the five minutes. Um, so we'll, we'll keep everybody in suspense on this. Um, Kerry, if you could please stop sharing for us at this at this point. Thanks. So at this point, before we start with the q and I, I would just like to thank our presenters, our guest speakers this evening. First of all, for being 
invested in the protection and conservation of vultures on an emotional level, on a clearly some of you in a financial level and, and your education, your work, you've dedicated your life so far and probably will keep on dedicating your life to the conservation of these birds. And we thank you for that. We're going to need a lot of people with this kind of drive and passion to save a lot of species and we can learn from you. And we did learn tonight. Secondly, thank you for a stunning presentation with beautiful photographs where we could see your dedication and also appreciate the animals um, for what they are. Thanks, and thanks. I just want to add my uh, word of thanks to the awesome uh, talk that you guys gave us this evening, and I'm sure there's a, a lot of questions in the audience. So if we can just ask everybody, <clears throat> the easiest way is if you go to the bottom of the screen um, and you've got the reaction tools, if you can press your raise hand and then we'll see your hands going up and um, be able to answer your questions. But if you are uh, nervous um, to speak aloud, then you can also put a question in the chat or just wave at the screen. So I think uh, th uh, we've got a, our first question that's from Ron, I think I, I hope I've pronounced your, na your uh, name correctly. So, uh, Quib, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Um, it should come up on your screen. There you go. Yes. Um, <coughs> thank you very much, Marty. The correct pronunciation is Riem, um, but that's all in order. Um, I do leadership development within schools, currently 1,700 schools in South Africa. And I was wondering whether we have youth specific. Um, educational packs or educational focuses as opposed to focusing on adults, I believe we should start young. Thank you so much. Is your question posed to one of the uh, ladies specifically or generally all three? I don't know. You can blow my hair back. One or all three. Thank <laughs> you. I would say that that's for Carrie. <laughs> Um, we do have extensive um, educational booklets for all ages. You know, we at Volcro believe that um, we need to educate different demographics, ages, um, all walks of life in order to maximize the impact we have. And so we have created educational material for younger kids, for slightly older kids, as well as for adults. Um, and so we do have, and we're actually busy at the moment, um, redesigning our educational documents. And in fact, with one of our funders at TASC, we are in, in, the, in prepar uh, we, we just completed our uh, latest um, kiddies educational booklet that will be available as well. So hopefully that will be available online, but we will have printed material as well. So if you are interested, you're welcome to get hold of me. Uh, thanks, Kuba. Um, uh, thanks for the question and uh, thanks, Kate, for the answer. Um, if we can quickly, I do uh, note your hand, um, Roland. We will get to you now. Uh, we've got one question or uh, maybe a comment that came fairly early on in the chat about strong stomach acids like hyenas and crocodiles, question mark. So I'm not sure if it's a statement or if it's a question, uh, but uh, maybe if you can just speak maybe a little bit more about the stomach acids of vultures, is it similar to those two other mentioned animals? Um, I'm not sure if Corinne knows. Uh, Corinne uh, probably works with more species than I do, but the, the acidity in a vulture's stomach is 10 times more powerful than what ours is. And, um, in order to understand that, if you have a pool and you use chlorine and acid, it works in a very similar manner in that it actually just kills um, anything that it comes um, in contact with. But with regards to other species, you know, something like a crocodile, I can't unfortunately answer, but maybe chlorine or Darcy, no. Don't know stomach acid for crocodile and hate off the top of my head. Um, I would say the other advantage that I think vultures have in feeding um, and avoiding disease transmission is that because they're birds primarily eating mammalian carcasses, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot less disease transmission that can happen there. And so that ends up being a, a bit of a pr protective element for vultures as well, in addition to that really strong stomach acid. 
And so I think not so much crocodiles maybe, but when we think about hyenas and scavengers, um, and Darcy could really speak to this, you know, part of the concern is the disease transmission between those mammalian scavengers, both with the carcass, but then with each other. And those are elements that just aren't as big a concern when you have a bird um, in, in the situation. So that's, that's part of where vultures hopefully don't spread disease the same way that other mammalian scavengers can. I'll let Darcy maybe comment on that further. Yeah, I'll just be brief. Um, from what I know, hyenas are not as acidic. Um, personally, I would have thought they were probably fairly close, but somebody said there has been something published that they're less acidic than vultures. Um, but yeah, you don't, I don't, I can't speak to crocodiles, but certainly um, you don't hear or see a lot about hyenas transmitting diseases. That's why I specifically mentioned the canids, the dogs, the jackals, um, even wild dogs, um, highly susceptible um, to various diseases. Um, and I think that's probably where the biggest problem lies in the future, less so with hyenas, yeah. Because they are obviously fairly well adapted to scavenging too for a mammal. Great, uh, thanks for those answers. Um, I, we actually did also get an answer in the chat from Percy did have his hand up a second ago. So because it's related to the first um, question, I was gonna unmute him and just ask him if you wanted to add anything further or I can read out his um, his answer. Let me just uh, try and unmute Percy quickly. Ask him to unmute Percy, if you want to. Yeah, hi. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Percy Awari, I'm from India. I work uh, with the SAVE consortium for Culture conservation in South Asia. So just to add on to this, so there was this beautiful work was published by Dr. David Houston, wherein he actually, while he was looking at uh, a, a carcass and uh, the Egyptian vultures were consuming the lion feces as compared to the hyena feces. So he actually went back to a wet school and he measured the intestinal gastrointestinal system along uh, in comparison to the length of the body of the animal and he found out that the hyenas they digest it better so the nutrients which are available in the feces are much less and that is why the egyptian vulture who consume the lion feces number one and then he postulated that uh, with uh, vultures i think uh, it is somewhere around 96% is the digestibility. So whatever they eat, they can definitely digest that. That is number one. And they also have, I think, costereal organisms as a commensal in their uh, gastrointestinal tract. And they are known to, yeah, as mentioned in the talk also, that they are known to uh, digest or prevent the spread of anthrax as well. So just wanted to add that much over there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Percy, for your valuable input on that. I appreciate it. Um, let's go quickly to Roland. Um, Roland, I'm asking you to unmute. OK, thank you very much. Uh, great presentation. And I uh, thank you. Um, I learned a lot. I'm a game ranger in Angola. This is for e any one of the, uh, the three panelists. Uh, the, the spreading of diseases like bovine tuberculosis or anthrax, um, I understand in terms of um, the processing of the carcass, but I'm convinced, I don't understand, perhaps you can assist me, about the spread of those uh, spores or whatever on the, animal, on the bird's beaks or on its talons, uh, are they spread? In that way, I can understand through the digestive system of the feces, but in terms of con uh, contamination on the actual physical body of the of the bird, how is that? Uh, is it a percentage? How does it work? Thanks, Roland. Uh, whichever lady is brave, go for it. <laughs> I don't mind taking that because, yeah, I, it's a really good point. Um, we didn't bring that up. Um, well, partly because. We really don't know, but yeah, the question is, you know, vultures can help reduce disease transmission, we believe, um, but they could also, there's a question about whether they're actually helping to spread it. 
Um, and that is, it has been, there has been a few studies like Dr. Peter Mundy um, did some initial work um, and never actually found any, um, I can't remember, anthrax antibodies, I think it was, um, never found them in, in vultures that had, um, that they tested. But again, I were, the problem was that they didn't know for sure if those vultures had visited an anthrax carcass. So we have been talking um, a number of times, a number of times over many years um, about a study like this, particularly with uh, my colleague, Dr. Campbell Mern. Um, and yeah, and I know, um, I don't know, they started to do a little bit of work in Kruger to answer this, um, but we really haven't gotten a, a final answer on it that's definitive. But the right now, it, it seems there is a lot of questions about whether they can spread it by their beaks, by their feet, but um, preliminarily, it, the, it leans towards no, but we don't really know for sure. Thanks, Darcy. Um, Roland, are you satisfied with your answer? Any comment or? Okay, just simple. We don't know. That's the bottom line. So they could, or they may or they may not. So, I mean, for me, the spore can be easily trans, uh, transmitted on bodily contact to a water source, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't know. That's what you're telling me. I would say that's the safest answer, yeah. And there's also just a lot of unknowns about anthrax. Um, it's a really hard disease to study. Um, so that is part of the reason too. Okay, I understand, thank you. Thanks. Great, thanks. Maybe, maybe a topic for another talk about anthrax and other spore-borne diseases. Um, I'll go next to Babajida Agbula. Yeah. Morty, if I may, um, I just want to, uh, Percy shared with us a, a blog post from Scientific, Scientific America talking about uh, vultures, hippos, and anthrax. So just want to, it's in the chat section uh, way at the bottom. So maybe uh, Roland and everyone else can go and give it a read. Sorry for interrupting you, Maury. No, no problem. Thanks. I, 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 and then, uh, uh, post. I won't answer the question here, but, um, but it's, yeah, it was interesting that that way. So. Yeah, that 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 um, yeah, that post uh, mostly sort of explores the yeah the relationship that because hippos are obviously a, a common victim of anthrax outbreaks and the relationship that vultures have with them. Um, and there's been some interesting work out of Ruaha National Park showing how hippos actually can move anthrax upstream um, through their their own movements, um, and then how the vultures are tracking the the anthrax outbreak um, as the hippos move it from pool to pool. So we actually still have have some data and some more work to do on that. But yeah, I think anthrax remains an area of a lot of interest and in study. Perfect, thanks for your answers. Um, if I can ask uh, Babajida to unmute and if you're uh, comfortable, uh, turn on your camera, please. Hello there, everybody. Um, a very nice presentation and um, yeah, and nice work back there. My one is that we, you are leaving West Africa out. Um, I'm a veterinary practitioner, and um, in my early days, I did a lot of work with um, Fulani Hertzman. And Diclofenac was uh, implicated with um, the loss of vultures because um, it was used indiscriminately by some of these herdsmen on their cattle when they are sick. So. Now, you've not mentioned that in your presentation. I think it's something worth looking into because if that cofinance is not controlled, we'll have them wiped out, wipe out the whole uh, vulture population in West Africa because it's readily available off the shelf for um, herdsmen to use. And this indiscriminate use has really caused a lot of problems. So, Let's have some work going on in West Africa, although um, it's a very hard place to work, I know. But with the young conservation is coming up in this locality, they can be good foot soldiers for getting research done. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks, Baba Gina. 
sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Marty. No, go for it. <laughs> Sure. I say, you should probably take some of this. I mean, I, I will say that uh, diclofenac is definitely widely available throughout a lot of Africa and used both for human and veterinary uses. So there's there is that concern, and that gets raised um, ever so often. In general, there hasn't been a lot of evidence that vultures are exposed to diclofenac in um, at least in, in East Africa. Um, typically. Livestock, but you know, the, the reason, like, so just a little background for those that maybe aren't familiar with diclofenac and its effect in, in Asia. So, um, in India, veterinary use of diclofenac uh, in cattle led to high rates of exposure for vultures. So, they were consuming cows that had um, diclofenac in their system, which is actually just an anti inflammatory drug. It's a very common um, and widely used drug. Uh, but when it became widely used for veterinary purposes in India, vultures were being exposed to it because the cows were generally being left out for vultures to consume, <clears throat> um, which is obviously very different than what happens in, in most African countries, right? You don't have that same uh, level of, of cattle just being left out. Uh, we did some surveys in, in Kenya, actually, in collaboration with, with a parent farm and master student there looking at people's use of livestock and, um, you know, around Masemar communities were saying that even if a cow had died of tuberculosis, they would still eat the meat from it. It's, it's a very different, I think, mindset about how livestock are consumed and utilized. And as a result, livestock carcasses with diclofenic in them, while they may exist in Africa, I think are much less likely to be consumed by vultures. And so generally we, we, haven't viewed it as being a major issue, although obviously it's something to be very conscious of given the effect that it had on uh, sort of has been deemed the primary cause of the, the rapid declines of vultures in, in Southeast Asia. So it is something I think that everyone's aware of. In terms of West African work, I think we all agree that there's a huge need for more work in West Africa. And uh, Darcy might want to speak to a, um, a new grant that she's been working on uh, to try and address some of that. Yeah, I'll just say, yeah, thanks for the prompt about West Africa, because actually there's there's quite a number of West Africans doing various work on vultures, um, you know, in Gambia, in Nigeria, in Ghana, um, in Guinea-Bissau. Um, yeah, just to name a few countries. Um, there's a woman we met recently in trying to do some work in Cameroon. Um, so I think there is a lot going on in West Africa. We definitely know of a lot of things. And there's particularly, I'll just mention this. Um, there is a, because there was something in the chat about the belief-based use. Um, there's a whole group um, that is putting together a plan about how to address belief-based use in, particularly in West Africa. And it's basically, looking at engaging governments and other um, regulatory authorities in terms of how 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 to address it because obviously there's a huge cultural issue you know with the belief this use so it makes it particularly difficult to tackle um but yeah just what Corinne was saying is that yeah we are um later this year going to be launching a African Raptor Leadership Grant. Um, I'm not going to say too much about it now. It can be used for obviously for vultures, but any species of African raptors. And the idea is really to build leadership on the continent, um, particularly in underrepresented areas like West Africa, um, but many others um, in terms of, you know, having supporting master's level students to do projects that involve raptors. Um, so we're working with a number of universities, which include um, specific universities, which are um, the FIT, the Percy Fitzpatrick in South Africa, um, Aplori in Nigeria, and also Tof Tofal in Morocco. Um, so we'll be putting more information about this grant um, later on, probably in a few months, and it'll be on the Raptor Research Foundation's website because they're the ones helping to host it for us. Um, so I hope that does a little bit to answer some of that issue. Thanks, uh, Darcy. I'm just gonna go to some of the questions in the chat now if I can. 
I don't see any further hands up at this point. Um, there was a comment about educational programs. I know you did talk about educational material. Um, so I'm not sure if Cheryl, if your question uh, about educational programs pertaining to vultures has been addressed, but there is a further question that talks about educational events. And um, that was from, I think, Margaret uh, Cooper. Um, and she's asking, <clears throat> could you please say something of the legal frameworks of your work and some of the relevant legislation? Who do you want to answer that? Whoever knows the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it, I think it differs. I think it differs from country to country. So I don't think there's a, a one off answer. But you know, for any for any of our work, you've obviously got to have um, it's all highly regulated because vultures are CITES one listed species. So, you know, in my case, I need to have um, national permits, I need to have provincial permits, I need to have import and export for rehab. I, I mean, I have to have pretty much just about any and every permit you can possibly get um, in order to do the type of work. Same thing for research, you know, if you're doing research or, or um, any type of captures, you not only need to have the permits, but you also need to go through um, a very strict ethics process and you need to have ethics approval before you even get the permit and so it's you know you've got to basically just cover all your bases but yeah, you've got to have you've got to have the authorities on board and you've got to get permission in order to do what you do well thanks Kerry um, I, I see Cheryl's got a hand up and she had asked a question in chat. So maybe if you want to add, I'll unmute you. Ah, thanks, Marty. And um, yeah, guys, well done on a great presentation. But I just want to reiterate um, school groups. Do you get any schools coming out to you to actually view what you do? And have you had any chance or whatever to try and interlink your material into the school curriculum? Because I think this is one of the crucial things that we need to address. We need to try and make our youth, the our youngsters, the future generation to become more proactive and to try and make a change. We start young and move up, yeah. So Cheryl, we do have school groups, um, not often just because we're quite a small team and um, it's just quite difficult juggling. Um, but we do, you know, we would like to definitely do more of it. We're not a zoo facility by any means. So we're not wanting hundreds of thousands of people coming through our doors at all. You know, we're, we're strictly a conservation center. So we prefer smaller groups. You know, we can do a 30 maximum. So if we get 60 kids, we break them up into two groups. We don't want to stress the birds out. Um, and then with regards to getting it included in the curriculum, um, again, this is just a time. It is something that we would like to work on. And in fact, on Monday, we've got a, a strategy meeting. And education is something that I'm wanting to really focus on this year. It's just expertise and time, really, because, um, yeah, as I said, we've got 270 birds and we don't, you know, we're multifaceted. So we're not only focused at the center and we only have eight staff members to put things into perspective. So it is hugely, hugely important. It's just a matter of getting the time. <laughs> I would just say in Kenya, um, again, just like Carrie's saying, we, we don't have much, a lot of capacity, but we work with partners and we have a really important partner, which is the Kenya Bird of Prey Trust. Um, and they have, they have, well, one main facility and that also has kind of like Carrie, but on a smaller um, scale, um, they have about, I don't know how many captive um, non-releasable vultures they have. I think it's maybe eight or nine, but they also have other birds of prey there. And they are open to school groups. Um, if anyone's in Kenya wants to go see, it's a fantastic facility to go and learn about birds of prey um, and vultures and to see them up close. Um, yeah, so I think that's 
our solution here is just, yeah, we work really close with partners who can deliver on that. Oh, great. Thank you. Because I'm a bit worried about the belief-based use because, um, yeah, mm. that's quite strong and that's going to have some kind of impact as well, as you spoke about tonight on the vultures. So, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure every little bit is is actually helping and, yeah, you're making a huge difference. Well done. And some of my past students have actually worked for you guys. And, yeah, Kerry, they know you well and I know you well as well. So, Darcy, um, Corinne, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kerry. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, I'm going to ask a quick question out of the chat if I can, and then we'll get to Andy, who's got his hand up. Um, the question is from uh, what from your experience is the gap that conservation social scientists contribute to vultures or owl protection? So I think um, if you can speak to the um, vultures specifically um, from a, a conservation social scientist point of view, any, any one of the, the three uh, of you? Sure. Um, the Darcy can actually probably speak to the owl, owl piece. Uh, but I, <laughs> on, the, on the vulture side, um, Darcy and I actually just are working with a social scientist right now to try and better understand the motivations for poisoning for community members and to better establish how the trainings and addressing human wildlife conflict might affect that kind of um, that motivation and, and the use of poisons. So I think it's these are not easy questions to answer, especially because you're dealing with illegal activities that people may be sensitive about kind of sharing what they're really doing. Um, so there's definitely a lot of need for more social science in relation to vulture conservation. And that's, that's one key area that we're hoping to work on soon. I think the other piece is the, the trade and really understanding uh, what the motivations are, what really can address it. There are some groups that have taken on things like uh, vegetable-based uh, alternatives to, to vultures or other things, but I, I, there needs to be more investigation, I think, into how effective uh, those kinds of alternatives can be, because obviously the beliefs themselves may be very challenging to affect. Um, so I think that's that's a particular area that really needs a lot more social science work. Okay, great. Thanks for that answer. Um, we're going to try and uh, rush ahead. There's a lot of questions and uh, more hands out, and I've got 10 minutes of battery life left have been load shed since six o'clock. So let's quickly ask uh, Andy to ask his question. Cool, thanks, Marty. And thank all three of you very much for a brilliant presentation and all the work you're doing. Um, it's a bit of a personal question to each of you. I hope you don't mind. Um, the, the pictures of the mortality events you showed us are absolutely heartbreaking, seeing them from all the way in the UK on a screen. And it's obviously something you all encounter quite regularly um, over the years with your work and it takes a toll. I just wonder what sort of coping mechanisms and strategies you have in place to enable you to keep going, because it, it would break a lot of people and you're clearly doing it. And, you know, it's just a superpower. We all need to understand a bit more to keep us all going wherever we are and whatever we're trying to do in these fields. So thank you again. And over to you. Thanks. Carrie, do you want to go first? <laughs> um, sure. It is, it is really hard. You know, there's a couple of projects that we stopped. We were we were doing the toxicity trials initially for the Asian vulture crisis, um, where we had to test drugs like diclofenac. We then did safety trials, which ended up being toxic trials. And we continued with those trials up until a few years ago, where I could no longer actually handle going through the, the turmoil of, of looking and, and kind of watching these birds go through various toxic symptoms. Um, so it does definitely get to you and it does affect you. From, from a rehab point of view, I think the birds give you strength themselves. You know, when you, when you have a bird in hand and it's got a bone sticking out and maggots coming out of the bone, and yet they, they still want to live. That's what gives you the strength. Or you have a bird that comes in and it's paralyzed and every day it shows slight improvement. You keep fighting for it. And then I think when you do the ultimate releases, that's, that's a reminder of, of why we do what we do. And I think the rehab side really does keep me grounded because it keeps me emotionally involved but it also kind of 
is a bit of a pin, but it kind of gives me wings to continue going. Um, and I, I don't think one can ever not be emotionally moved and um, affected by it, because I think if you're not still emotionally affected by it, then you probably shouldn't be doing it anymore. You know, so I think we've probably all shed many, many tears. We've probably all bashed our heads against a brick wall thinking, why are we doing what we do? Because maybe we're fighting a losing battle. And I'm sure every single day, all three of us feel that way. But when you do win occasionally, that's what drives us. And at least that's what drives me. I would agree. Um, I'm not as hands-on, um, in particularly in terms of rehab as Carrie is, and then um, we're experiencing. But I would say, you know, one of the things I've done for many years um, with a colleague, and Andre Botha, I'm sure some of you know him, um, at Endangered Wildlife Trust, is we are kind of the, the two main people behind uh, the the African Wildlife Poisoning Database, um, and kind of getting all the um, records that you know people mention, but then you have to kind of follow up to get the actual details and everything. So the database is useful. Um, and um, yeah, I would say there is a certain time where you just kind of, you know, you have to put up a little bit of a wall between yourself and, and what, what is actually going on. Even five minutes before we were on this call, um, there's, I just got some photos coming through of a, a white-headed vulture that was poisoned in the Mara, and there's a couple others that have been poisoned this week. Um, yeah, it's 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 really tough, but I think I agree with Carrie that you know it's the little wins, and I think for us, it's about the communities that we work with. Um, I didn't I didn't get a chance to mention that actually, um, in part of our evaluations that um, we the team does. With the people that we've trained, um, we specifically ask them about poisoning incidences, and um, we get a lot of people. Um, we've had about fifty-one poisoning incidences in the last few years, where people have prevented them, um, and we get this information because we keep this network really strong of our from our trainees. Um, so we're we're really confident that those are actually true. Um, and the interesting thing about it is that sixty-five percent of those um, of those cases where poisoning was prevented, um, they're by women. Um, and that's a really important fa um, part of this conversation that we really didn't touch on. And it's getting off your question, I know, but I just wanted to mention that women are really engaged um, disproportionately in the, in the issues of, you know, human health and the environment. Um, so they are really important to bring into this conversation, especially around poisoning. But I think we all, you know, it's good to have a team and it's good to share because, yeah, it does get overwhelming. But I appreciate your question. Thanks. Do you want me to take this also or do you want to take another question? Um, yeah, you want to think uh, probably uh, yes, uh, Marty dropped out. Yes. Yusuf's hand is up, Chris, if we can allow him. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you very much. Yusuf. Hello, sir. Uh, sir to everyone. Uh, thank you very much. We have really enjoyed the lessons uh, the participations. And uh, I'm saying that uh, here in Kenya and uh, basically, especially in Garissa County, uh, a rural call, uh, like there are uh, people normally, they, 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 they prayed animals uh, whereby uh, normally uh, woman wildlife conflict is uh, is, 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 is mostly happen whereby uh, uh, a hyena prey the, the livestock, then they spray uh, using a poison, and then uh, the vultures come to 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 prey daytime, and uh, most of the most of them become victim whereby uh, the communities indigenous communities use uh, one way of uh, eliminating the the the, the 
they have beavers uh, like a hyena and a lion. Then the, 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 the first child become uh, a victim. And uh, she was uh, maybe was looking uh, something to it uh, in, on a daily basis. And uh, one of the things that needed to be addressed in the indigenous communities and, and the most marginalized communities in rural areas is that uh, poisons, poisoning the, the, the prey the animals at nighttime by hyenas and uh, lions. And it needs at least uh, some measures to put in, uh, in my rural area, whereby at least we are dealing with the community conservation, basically community-based conservation. And uh, it, it need a community sensitization, uh, making them to understand that uh, it is not only that uh, the hyenas will, will die, and vultures, vultures like animals, uh, small birds like vultures and other, other things uh, will be victimized in case uh, uh, in case uh, they they portion they portion the the carcasses, so it is really it is really hard and it is really happening daily basis, and uh, in in my area where I I come from and we practice uh, community based organizations uh, on conservation, vulture uh, is really in extinction whereby that's really lost because of uh, because of uh, communities adapting poisoning the carcasses. So it is really hard. It is really hard, and uh, we, we 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 are feeling very very sorry for such uh, things to happen. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we have really enjoyed. It. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you. you sir, uh, for that. Uh, Thank you. Yes, <coughs> yeah, sorry, I've been now transferred to my phone with a power problem. If I can quickly jump to Catherine, she's uh, been uh, on for a while. If you guys could uh, just unmute her for me, I um, uh, can't do that off my phone. <laughs> Am I unmuted? There we go. Um, <laughs> first off, thanks for talking this evening. Um, I'm in London, so it is evening for me. Um, but it's really exciting because actually I've just finished a year doing my master's and I did two dissertations, both of them on vultures, one looking at population trends um, with Dr. Sarah Durant at um, ZSL in the Serengeti over 40 years. And then the other one was looking at skull morphology, um, sort of the gulper ripper scrapper feeding type uh, propositions by Hertel. Um, and so, I mean, I've definitely cited uh, both Dr. Kendall and Dr. Ogata a lot <laughs> in my research. So it's really exciting. Um, but I guess I have kind of a general question. I mean, I've got a million questions, but um, a general question for all three of you with sort of being a part of the next, feeling like this is such a pressing conservation issue and feeling like the vultures are, you know, they're disproportionately understudied for having, for being keystone species, for being large bodied vertebrates, for being birds, um, all of these reasons to know more about them. Um, and we're losing them so quickly that I'm just kind of curious in, in each of your opinions, if you could, because you are talking to the next generation of, of vulture scientists, um, if you had suggestions or, or you know, what was your idea of, of what's, what the most urgent, what the most pressing areas of research, what do we need to know about them if that's um, cognition or it's, you know, spatial ecology or, or where it is that you would like to see um, the body of research go next. Yeah. Uh, feel free to answer whoever feels. Uh, All right, I'll, they have the <laughs> I'll start. Uh, well, my obvious interest, and I think there's a lot more to do is, is in the disease transmission. Um, it's really hard. Um, we did that, st that study with carcasses and that was sort of a, a big step in the right direction, but there's still a lot more. So, um, yeah, it, it takes a lot of time and investment because I think each disease, what people don't realize is that each, each pathogen that we're talking about is really different. So you can't just say diseases do this or vultures do this, to, you know, in terms of disease control, because every pathogen acts differently, it's transmitted differently, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's tons to be done um, in the field of disease transmission. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think there's there's definitely lots more to be done. Um, one of the areas that we've started getting more into is looking at sort of individual differences um, and trying to understand why, you know, one vulture has a range that stays within the protected area and another individual is, you know, going all over an entire country. Um, and I think there's a lot more to be done on on that, both from the, the movement side and the behavioral side uh, that may have some interesting conservation ramifications. So uh, that's that's one of the areas that we're looking into a lot right now. Great, thanks uh, for your question, Catherine. Um, if we can maybe quickly just jump to the chat again, there's a couple of questions that have been asked about the satellite track, <coughs> tracking and tracking tags and things. Some of them have been asked, uh, is answered already in the chat, so if you guys can go and look in the chat. But the one question is asking, what system is it that you use? Um, so maybe if you can just uh, answer with the name of the system that you guys do use. Yeah, I think um, I tried to answer some of those. So we use GSM. I've used GSM tags in the past. We also currently use satellite tags, uh, mostly for microwave telemetry. But I know uh, I think Darcy's using Savannah tracking right now. Carrie is like the the amazing tester of all different types of units. So she'd have to give you a long list, I think, of all the different things she's she's worked with. Um, so there's definitely a lot of options out there in terms of, of vulture tags. And it just depends on location. So some of the places where we work in southern Tanzania, the GSM and cell phone coverage just isn't good enough to support uh, those kind of systems, which is why we have to use satellite. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, if I can, maybe just move over to one of the other questions quickly, and then we'll get to um, Roland. Um, and again, when you get when we get to, if you can be quick with it, because there's someone also waiting after you. But um, there's a, a question here about what kind of volunteer opportunities do you guys offer at your um, various um, facilities? Um, I'll answer. Um, from a Volpris pers uh, perspective, we offer volunteer opportunities at the center um, where you can obviously um, experience firsthand the captive side of things, but you can also go out into the field um, undertake um, tree nesting surveys or cliff uh, nesting monitoring. There's also opportunities to participate in the capture breeding program, uh, the rehabilitation side of things, um, power line um, work as well. So we try and make it as inclusive as we possibly can. And we try to mold the volunteer experience according to what each volunteer is interested in. And this, you know, they're different seasons. Um, so if you're interested in captive breeding, then we'll um, advise the best season and time to come for that. Um, but yeah, so there's there's a range of opportunities with regards to volunteering um, with us. We don't charge at all. We believe in a win-win situation. So we do not um, ask for anyone to pay for the volunteer experience. You just basically pay for your board and lodging. And that's about it. Great, thanks for that answer, Kerry. I don't know if the um, other guys want to answer um, quickly and then we'll go to Roland after that. My answer would just be go to Kerry because we don't have the capacity <laughs> to, to offer any volunteer opportunities. Unfortunately, we have a very small team of four people um, and really no um, facilities to house anybody. So unfortunately, we don't have anything to offer. Thanks, Darcy and Kareen. Yeah, same thing here. I think Carrie's the best <laughs> opportunity to get the, get up and close with some vultures. Carrie, prepare for the floods. Um, <laughs> Roland, if you want to um, unmute, uh, so if Brian, if you can uh, help him to unmute, I can't do it from my phone. <laughs> uh, I'll probably aim this at Darcy because it's a continuation of what we discussed earlier about the spreading of diseases. Okay, uh, more about anthrax, but it can be bovine tuberculosis. I'd be very surprised that um, I know how vultures go in, head, uh, feed and all into a carcass, that uh, they won't get contaminated by spores from uh, anthrax on their feathers, especially, and then go somewhere else. But the most important thing is do vultures die of anthrax? 
um, if they um, if they breathe in the spores, would that kill them? And when they go, would that be a source of anthrax where they die? Just that, like if they fall into a water hole or something. Um, that's uh, basically uh, a quick question. Thanks, Darcy. I've never heard of a vulture dying from anthrax. You guys? Yeah. No. Um, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think what's, what's tricky is that, yeah, for the most part, vultures don't seem to contract any of these diseases. And kind of getting back to some of the earlier discussion, we don't entirely know if that's just because of their stomach acid and their digestive system, if that's because of kind of the bird mammal uh, transmission and, and things that birds aren't susceptible to. There's been some really good work on hyenas that shows that a lot of their ability to avoid disease actually has, has a lot to do with their immune system as well as their digestive system. For the most part, uh, the, the limited work that's been done on immunology and vultures, they don't seem to have the same um, they, they don't they, they don't generally seem to pick up many diseases, but they also don't seem to be dealing with that exposure through their immune system as much. But again, that's an area of limited research where we really, really need to do more. Um, so, yeah. Thanks a lot for that. Um, I, th I think uh, from, from the Gimba's um, hand has been up for a while. If we can um, ask him to unmute and to ask his question. If someone can help him unmute, um, please. Uh, just give me two seconds. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, um, I just want to uh, comment on the Baba uh, um, the comment last time. He commented on concerning West Africa. I'm from West Africa, especially in Gambia. Uh, actually, uh, what he said is true uh, concerning diclofen. We have an incident in the Gambia here, two incidents which caused by diclofen. Um, uh, we lose almost, uh, uh, the first one, we lose 15 hooded vulture, and the second one was uh, about 21 hooded vulture, which is a, a, a very serious case uh, uh, we are facing. And also, one of our threat also is uh, this belief base. Uh, just uh, two weeks ago, we, uh, we apprehended um, uh, a local, uh, uh, somebody who came from all over from Mali, which is almost two, two country away from uh, Gambia. Uh, he brought uh, some, uh, I, I love to share those uh, pictures, uh, but unfortunately I was trying to send it to the uh, chat group, but unfortunately it couldn't work. Uh, we, 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 uh, we, uh, we, we confiscate all these uh, um, the vulture parts, heads and uh, bones, and also some other species of animals, which is, it's a big problem in West Africa, this belief based. And uh, also another issue is this medicines. Um, like uh, some of our traditional healers, they are using virtual paths uh, for, for medicines. Uh, uh, we develop a regional program, which is um, Gambia, Senegal, uh, Mauritania. No, Gambia, Senegal and Guinea-Bissau. We are working on uh, this belief base like uh, um, a proposals, we submitted a proposal, joint proposals with uh, Bad Life International, which uh, first phase was done. We did some um, the, um, census we, uh, population count. About Gambia is about 5,000 uh, hooded vulture. And I also did some sensitizations on the, this uh, belief base, but it, it was a small funding, which is we only did it in one region. And uh, this next phase, we, have, um, we want to do it all over the country for these three countries, because we are facing uh, big problems, especially this uh, virtual past trans, uh, uh, um, um, moving them from the other part of the African country to Gambia. Uh, although for us, because our parks and wildlife, they are very serious about, um, like if they caught you with killing all those vultures, they, 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 they prosecute you. Um, that's why most of our parts, the parts they sell here are coming from outside. So um, it's a problem in, the, in, in West Africa. Uh, in October, I traveled to Nigeria. We developed a West African vulture species action plans, which is still now going on. 
and uh, um, we, 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 these are the, some of the threats we are facing it, uh, belief based um, uh, poisonings and uh, um, um, diclofins and other uh, uh, threats. These are some of the threats we are facing in West Africa. So I just want to share this thing uh, with you guys. Uh, um, like, I would like to say the thank you these presenters. Um, they did a very uh, good presentations, which uh, I learned a lot from them there. Um, I would love this uh, session to be continued to share information to each other. I was suggesting if we can create a group of email where if you have a problem or an suggestion or any uh, issue you want to ask, you can uh, send those questions there or WhatsApp group, which is very fast. Uh, uh, I was suggesting that. Thank you very much for everyone. Okay, bye. Thanks, Fagimba. It's great to hear from you. I actually just wanted to make a comment to Yusuf, um, just a quick one, um, just to say he touched on a really good, interesting point in terms of communities because, um, you know, we have a lot of different ethnic groups within Kenya, and we all know that's common in Africa. And I would say, you know, it is challenging to work with some groups more than others um, because there is this culture of poisoning more so in some um, communities than others. Um, and we were actually just, um, we came out to your area not that long ago um, in November last year. Uh, we were training in Wajir South in um, Sabuli Conservancy. So we haven't forgotten about you out there in, in Garissa, but it's kind of far for us right now. Thanks. Marty, I just want to check if you are unmuted. Yeah, uh, just unmuted. Yeah, so um, thanks everybody for all your answers. I think we are almost out of time or are out of time. And I think there's a lot more questions still. So I think we will post um, those questions through to the, the ladies and hopefully they can um, give some answers to the guys. And I think Kareen specifically needs to leave. So um, thank you very much um, for your input uh, specifically. And if you are gonna um, go, I'm not too sure uh, the rest of the team, if they're able to maybe answer one or two more or if we're gonna call it a, a, a night. <laughs> Yeah, I'm unfortunately off to, to another meeting, but thank you so much. I really appreciate all the great questions from everybody. And it's yeah, it was nice to be uh, yeah, with a, in a team with Darcy and Carrie on um, many, many different levels. So <laughs> uh, bye, everyone. Good evening. Uh, yes, thanks a lot. Corinne, before you go, I just want to mention to the three of you, very informative, very touching, very professional. What we could try and do, we run a program called Edu Conservation, where we enrich the curricula of schools. And I will connect with Julie Cleverden heading that program to see if we can do something about vultures, uh, putting that into the curricula of schools. We work in, work in six Africa countries. To all of you, thank you very much. John and Margaret, sorry that we had to cut you off. These people have to go. You've done an incredible job. Thank you. And uh, yeah, John and Margaret on stands, really appreciate it. Okay, um, uh, I think it's uh, everybody, thank you so much, thanks. It was very interesting and fascinating and so many people in, 155 I think is incredible. And uh, that, and they kept in till the end, that's a compliment to all of you. So well done, Johan and Ruan and the whole team, it was excellent. Thank you guys, I think you've got a call of the day, all right. Take care and have a good Thanks morning very much. and a good night wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you Bye. for the opportunity. Bye. Thank you very much, Darcy. Cheers, everyone.